The following is a reflection on the readings for Tuesday of the 27th week of Ordinary Time. Our first reading is Galatians chapter 1, verses 13 to 24. Our responsorial is Psalm 139. And the Gospel is Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42. In today's first reading, Paul defends his divinely given authority as an apostle to teach correctly the faith. In chapter 1, verse 12, he states, quote, For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Christ. End of quote. We see how this happened in Acts chapter 26, verses 16 to 17, when, at his conversion on the road to Damascus, Jesus speaks thus, quote, I have appeared to you to make you a witness both of the things which you have seen and of things which I will yet reveal to you. End of quote. Thus, Paul's authority did not come from tradition or being instructed by the other apostles, but since it was given by direct revelation of Christ, it could not conflict with what Christ revealed to the other apostles. Paul says that his commission as an apostle was in fact conferred by God before birth. We find similar commissions in the Old Testament with, for example, Jeremiah, quote, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations, end of quote. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. See also Isaiah chapter 49, verses 1 to 3. St. Paul further substantiates his claim as an apostle by stating that he had seen the risen Lord, an essential requirement for apostleship in the scriptures. To confront the claims of the false teachers, Paul argues that in fact he was, prior to his conversion, better trained and more zealous for the Old Testament law than the Judaizers in Galatia. Thus he was better prepared to meet their objections based on the Old Testament, quote, works of the law, which the Judaizers insisted that new converts to Christianity maintain and practice. To make the point crystal clear, Paul then launches into a defense of his authority by reviewing his credentials in Judaism and his actions post-conversion, where he did not confer with flesh and blood, nor go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles, but went into seclusion in the wilderness of Arabia. After three years, he finally met with Peter and James in Jerusalem for fifteen days. In the early part of the letter to the Galatians, Paul emphasizes his direct contact with Christ as the basis for his authority. This theme is continued by the psalmist, but now from the opposite perspective of Christ, who knows us personally and intimately. Quote, O Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. End of quote. From both directions, therefore, personal contact and knowledge is vital. This is why in today's Gospel, Martha is told that Mary has chosen well by sitting quietly at Jesus' feet and listening to his teaching. Quote, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. End of quote. In baptism, we share in the ministry of Christ as priest, prophet, and king. Thus, a certain commission has been conferred on us to make a sacrifice of our lives as royal priests. St. Paul put it this way in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, quote, I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may prove what is the will of God, 
what is good and acceptable and perfect. End of quote. We also have the duty to proclaim the good news of Christ as part of our prophetic ministry. This would include teaching our children the Catholic faith, sharing the gospel with co-workers, and generally being ready, as St. Peter says, to give an answer for the hope that is within us. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Sharing in Christ's ministry as king involves, first of all, exercising discipline over our own passions so that they align to a well-formed intellect and will, and, secondly, in justice, making prudent decisions, giving direction to those under our care, whether family, employees, or other subordinates. The question is, what authority do we bring to these important roles? If it is merely an authority of office or title, then it is man-made, derivative and ineffective. At best, it will be merely functional, without passing on the virtues of faith, hope, and love, and at worst, it will cause scandal of all kinds. On the other hand, there is an authority that is charismatic in nature, that is, led by the Holy Spirit, and therefore essential to one's character. This is the authority that startled the crowds in the early part of Jesus' ministry. They were used to the scribes and Pharisees exercising dominion, but from a shallow, derivative sense, always quoting other rabbis and adding human regulations upon regulations, so that the crowd was weighed down and burdened. Then there was Christ, who taught from a relationship with his Father, and after much prayer, which moved the people to listen. They were encouraged by words of love and compassion that carried a different kind of weight, one that lightened the conscience because they offered true wisdom and hope. To the extent that we pray, opening ourselves to God's power, read sacred scripture and sacred tradition, accessing God's wisdom and revelation, and humble ourselves under God's mighty hand, we will exercise a charismatic authority that is persuasive to others and attractive. This is why the saints were such powerful witnesses to the faith. They were undergirded with Christ's authority so that in their ministry of teaching, caring for the sick, administering congregations, hospitals, and other charitable organizations, whatever persecution came their way did not darken their actions, but rather illuminated Christ. We need such saints today who with authentic holiness will once again startle our culture. The rise of postmodernism in the 20th century that continues today resulted from an authority exercised largely without connection to God. As a result, the secular mindset, grounded in a hyper-rationalism arising out of the Enlightenment, sought to tweak social and political institutions so that a utopia would finally arrive. The opposite happened, and after two devastating world wars and countless conflicts, postmodernism has rejected such authority so that relativism now reigns. Let us return to Christ, invoking the intercession of St. Paul, that we would build our lives on the truth, lived out in love. Let us pray. May your grace, O Lord, we pray, at all times go before and follow after, and make us always determined to carry out good works. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God for ever and ever. Amen.